test you've tested your screen share already yes okay perfect <laughs> after some attempts i think all right do you see full screen yeah okay okay the floor is yours okay so good afternoon everyone uh, my name is Mateo carly and this afternoon i will uh, try to introduce uh, some of the problem that one can face uh, when trying to compute high dimensional free energy landscape or high dimensional probability densities. And uh, I will also try to give some uh, possible um, solution that uh, we elaborated in our group. So when working with uh, uh, high dimensional uh, data, high dimensional data sets, uh, one, of course, faces the problem of uh, classifying and understanding and representing the huge amount of information they contain. And uh, of course, uh, in order to do so, uh, one key quantity is the probability density function of the data. Um, but uh, since data are generally distributed in the embedding space uh, in a non-homogeneous way, uh, one can hope that uh, there are some few relevant uh, degrees of freedom, few relevant uh, so-called collective variables that uh, are enough to uh, give, restricting to them, a satisfactory description of the problem one wants to study. And so um, and one, uh, one general approach in, 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 in big data challenges is uh, the one of free energy methods. Of course, uh, uh, as I said, the, the, the free energy methods are quite general, but uh, molecular simulation in which we are interested in, especially in this, uh, um, in this workshop are a, a, proto a prototypical example. In fact, uh, let's say uh, if I consider a molecular simulation, every time step I save vector of all the, for example, all the coordinates of my eight, of my atoms, which are molecular atoms and sometimes even water atoms. So uh, my data, my data space uh, is uh, of a vector of uh, thousands and even tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of coordinates. So uh, this is a really, really hard problem. So if one wants to go through a sort of a free energy uh, approach scheme, uh, this is a sort of a, a possible pipeline that one can, that one can follow. So first, uh, of course, uh, there is the problem of uh, uh, identifying uh, the, the, all the relevant degrees of freedom of, for my problem and uh, to restrict to them. And so this is the very known and very hard problem of the dimensionality reduction. Uh, but uh, assuming one can do it, and uh, so going from the full coordinate space uh, to, the, to this reduced space of collective variables, one can then try to compute the, the reduced probability density reduced to the space. And uh, of course, also, this is a very challenging task. And uh, there are uh, several methods that can that, that, uh, try to do it. And, uh, there are some parametric methods, which means that uh, methods that are trying to fit some functional form to the data, typically. And uh, there are non-parametric methods. Of course, the, the most famous is the one I represent in the picture is uh, the one is histograms, but in general, there are, for example, all the so-called kernel methods uh, of which we can say uh, the histogram is a uh, uh, part, uh, which generally depend on only uh, on a scale parameter that defines the resolution of uh, my non-parametric method uh, at which I want to say, look at the data. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, um, uh, to compute the probability density, and once uh, I have it, I can uh, 
Oh. Yes. I can compute uh, the free energy by taking by taking minus KBT the logarithm of the of the probability density, and uh, when I have it, uh, I can find extremal points on it. Uh, so landmarks on this uh, landscape, uh, maxima, minima, settle points, uh, and so characterize uh, how uh, what is the sort of uh, uh, yeah landscape that. The degrees of freedom go to uh, uh, go through during, uh, uh, in this case, a molecular simulation during their dynamics. When I have this, uh, when I have mapped this this landscape, I can assign uh, states, assign all the configuration to states, and so applying clustering. This is something, uh, for example, Alex Rodriguez has talked about uh, on Monday. And when I have uh, clustered uh, my data, uh, then I have uh, a description of my system. So in, in the following of the talk, I will mostly uh, focus on the problems that one faces until he uh, can get to uh, an estimation of the uh, probability density or the free energy. And the rest is, uh, uh, I don't have time to Sometimes I cannot go forward. Okay, so of course, um, uh, the first problem one faces is the one of uh, um, finding good collective variables. And one would like to do it automatically, but as we have also heard in some of the talks, uh, automatic um, collective variable selection is uh, a very challenging problem. It's an open problem. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there are attempts, even successful, uh, to do it uh, via machine learning uh, generally. Uh, but uh, for sure, uh, the thing one can do is to uh, resort to um, their intuition and insight about the chemical intuition about the problem one is studying uh, and uh, to define or, or supervise the, the collective variable definition like this. So for example, in the, in the very famous case, uh, very, uh, which is very didactical uh, of alanine decaptide, which is a peptide of uh, two residues and 22 atoms, um, the metastable states of this molecule are well described by only looking, by only projecting on these two uh, variables, which are two uh, backbone dihedral. So uh, the, the angles uh, around which uh, the two uh, alanines turn around, phi and psi, and uh, one can simply do a histogram of uh, this variable during a simulation and obtain this, uh, this kind of landscape. But of course, uh, uh, this is a very, um, this is not a realistic case one is, can be interested to study. Um, but for example, a realistic case uh, would have like, a, this is the case of uh, the main protease of SARS-CoV-2, for example. And one single monomer of, of this homodimer has uh, 306 residues and uh, around 5,000 atoms. So there is no hope that I can define uh, some collective variables with my uh, chemical intuition. Um, so at this point, uh, it's worth opening a parenthesis because I think that um, the concept of intrinsic dimensionality is, uh, uh, is very important. So I've talked about uh, uh, coordinate space or an embedding space, which is uh, uh, the space of all the uh, coordinates that I input my method, my protocol. That can be, of course, the Cartesian coordinates of all the atoms or, or only of the alpha carbons, the backbone dihedral angle. And this is uh, the embedding space, which has a dimension D, which is, for example, the 3N uh, that I had mentioned in my first slide. But then in this space, due to a soft, uh, soft chemical constraints or so called restraints, uh, so inhibition of visiting some 
parts of the configuration space, the data distribute themselves on a manifold, which is generally of a dimension much lower than the embedded dimension. And, uh, um, and so, uh, yeah, so this is called the intrinsic dimension. Intrinsic dimension uh, can be estimated, of course, and it's a very interesting problem. Some people in my group are doing that. For, for what we are concerned, it's important only to know that it is possible to estimate intrinsic dimensionality. And of course, since it's an intrinsic property of an embedding space, uh, it should not depend of, uh, on uh, the choice of some parameters. So of course, uh, uh, it is an intrinsic. Uh, and uh, uh, one very important remark is that uh, it's a very, so one can be tempted to use, uh, for example, two or maximum three collective variables to study a problem because uh, simply they're, they're the easiest to handle for, for us human. One, two, three collective variables we can visualize, we can manipulate, we can think about them. But if the intrinsic dimension of a problem is uh, higher uh, than the number of collective variables we retain, then uh, this can lead to misleading descriptions and uh, to wash out important details. So it's very uh, important not to do. Of course, one can have, uh, as the system I mentioned before, the main proteas of SARS-CoV-2, uh, an intrinsic dimensionality of 26. And uh, this is a very, very difficult to handle in uh, a visual way. So um, since uh, it's difficult to, to find collective variables based on intuition, uh, one can hope to do it to, to, to find collective variables automatically. And the simplest method is by linearly projecting on, the, uh, on a hypersurface, on a hyperplane of lower dimensionality. And the um, most famous way to do so is so-called principal component analysis, in which uh, one finds the eigenvector of uh, the correlation matrix of all the coordinates. And then if there is a gap in the spectrum of uh, this eigenvalue problem, uh, then uh, one has also found uh, which one is the intrinsic dimensionality. So if there is a gap in the spectrum after G eigenvalue, it means uh, the intrinsic dimensionality of the problem is not greater than G. And one can then project onto this uh, first uh, principal component. So here I have an example of a Swiss roll in three dimension, this surface. Uh, of course, PCA finds that the two principal, that one component uh, is uh, varying a little, as you see from the colors, and one uh, it would re retain two principal components. But of course, with our eyes, we can see that uh, actually this is a intrinsically a one-dimensional manifold. But now, PCA cannot, uh, cannot project anymore. And uh, as you can see in the image below, uh, it's, if one wants to project on one, on the principal component of this two-dimensional surface, one ends up with a meaningless description. And on the left, I also put another, another example of a three-well potential, the principal component is along the, mostly along the x-axis, but if one projects uh, along it, then one finds uh, a two metastable states free energy, which does not correspond to the, to the real one. When a linear projection fails, but uh, the, the manifold is still isomorphic to uh, a hyperplane, so, topologically, let's say, trivial, then one can hope to use a nonlinear projection method, which try basically to uh, find a nonlinear transformation of the coordinates to rectify, let's say, uh, the coordinates. So here I put the image of an iron, 
uh, and uh, the, there are several methods in literature and they work uh, even quite well in the case of non-complex topology. So here on the right, I have uh, uh, this wrist roll, which has been ironed by uh, local linear embedding into this uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional manifold. And then if I apply PCA, uh, I find something which is actually meaningful. And uh, so, um, as as I as we can see visually, we we, we find again that uh, our data are distributed on a, on a, the, the intrinsic dimensionality of our data is one. But uh, the the problem arises when, for example, there are uh, some uh, topological uh, complex features. Because, uh, for example, if there are loops, uh, I cannot hope to iron some uh, loopy form onto a higher of course, there are methods that try to combine, for example, PCA or uh, some nonlinear projection method locally, uh, for example, by defining chart that connect uh, local uh, maps. But uh, these uh, are quite recent and uh, it's, uh, they're also uh, quite complicated. So this was the problem of topology. The third problem one, has, one can face is the one of uh, uh, the curse of dimensionality. So here I want to, I, I made a simple example to illustrate the, the so-called bias variance trade-off. So I sampled a, one, uh, a one dimensional Gaussian with uh, uh, 1000 points. And I simply uh, put it into a histogram or six histogram with six different, uh, uh, so-called smoothing parameter, so six different bin widths. And uh, uh, so starting from the left, we can see that when uh, the number of bins is much lower than the number of the data points, then I have underfitting, I don't, I, I, I miss relevant feature. Of course, Gaussian does not have uh, uh, very complex features, but still we, we, we are not sure it is a Gaussian if we look at the leftmost picture, right? And so he, this is a case of high bias and underfitting. If I go all to the right, I can see that uh, basically I have this barcode uh, graph in which I cannot, of, of course, understand anything about uh, the data. And this is the case of uh, beans, uh, number of beans much higher than the number of data. Overfitting, I have high variance. It's, it's only variance, it's only noise. It's, there is a high, uh, a low signal to noise ratio. And while if I look at the middle, we see that uh, there is a good balance, uh, and there is a good generalization, and I can actually learn something from my data. But uh, so this was one dimensional. But when we go to uh, higher dimension, uh, the problem of uh, uh, bias variance trade-off is uh, even more delicate, and uh, the the risk of getting a pure noise, so having many more, let's say, uh, beings much more sensitivity than data, or to go in the opposite direction to uh, to to blur all my information on on many dimensions is very high, and so um, uh, and so this is a very very known problem in in estimating high dimension when dealing with high dimensional uh, probability distribution in general. So. Um, so over the years uh, in my group, uh, Alessandro and other collaborators uh, developed a protocol, which is uh, which is based on which tries to do the to go along the pipeline I illustrated in the first slide, and uh, yeah, so it it estimate, estimates the intrinsic dimensionality, the free energy at each point, and then it does a clustering and uh, tries to represent uh, the states it found. But I, in this talk, I will mostly focus 
I will only focus on the estimation of the free energy density at each point. We'll try to address all the all the problems I have uh, tried to explain, and uh, this method is called uh, free energy uh, is called the uh, PAC uh, point adaptive uh, kinetics neighbor, and uh, uh, it does not. Uh, uh, does not do an, implicit, an explicit dimensional reduction. So uh, to go around the problem of a collective variable selection, it works in complex topologies because it only looks at data uh, locally and uh, uh, it uh, handles uh, quite better than other methods, uh, the curse of dimensionality due to uh, an adaptive selection of the uh, uh, smoothing parameter and to the fact that by computing correctly the intrinsic dimensionality, we are able to restrict to the intrinsic manifold and not to dilute our information on uh, fake, let's say, dimension that are only, only fictitious in the embedding manifold. And the inputs are basically only a metric or a set of pairwise distances between points, and of course, a reliable intrinsic dimension estimator. What is the basic idea of uh, this method? Well, if I have, uh, uh, mm, if I sample points from a non-uniform density, but I go close enough to, to this uh, probability density, then uh, I cannot distinguish uh, between, uh, between this and a uniform distribution because uh, it's only a, a matter of scale. If I go close enough, the date, all data manifolds uh, looks, uh, uh, all the data manifolds look uh, locally uniform. And in fact, this is not uh, made up. This is actually the same Gaussian I'm plotting. If I take uh, the tangent, uh, if I project, uh, let's say the, the, the cusp of my Gaussian on the tangent hyperplane at the top, I cannot distinguish uh, the, 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 Gaussian, the Gaussian sample from a, from a uniform cell. Um, but at which scale does the sample look, look uniform? Of course, it depends on the points. For example, this is a two-dimensional, this is a scatter plot from a two-dimensional sample of a probability distribution that, that, that you, you can kind of, uh, uh, kind of grasp from the scatter plot already. Uh, so uh, going around the, going around the, the scatter plot, I see there are, for example, this is a low density region with the slowing varying uh, density. So uh, the scale at which I see uniform density uh, is a big radius and it includes a lot of points. In this point, there is a low density region, for example, but uh, there is a suddenly varying uh, density. So uh, the scale at which uh, the density is constant is quite small and there are a few points. And this, for example, is in the center of the, in, in, in one of the peaks of the distribution. And so even though uh, the, it's very fast, it varies very fast. Uh, I have a lot of points. So what we need, uh, so what we see is that this, uh, this scale at which my manifold is locally uh, uniform uh, has a, a point dependence. So what we do is uh, we estimate an optimal number of neighbors to look at in order to, uh, to which is uh, an adaptive and uh, depends, uh, yeah. so depends, depends on the point uh, and uh, it gives uh, the scale at which uh, in that point uh, uh, I can consider my, uh, my distribution uniform. Uh, I will not go into the detail of this adaptive K if we uh, will have time maybe later or in the Q and A session. But at the scale at which uh, the, my manifold looks uh, locally uniform, uh, I'm very close to the manifold. So I also see that the manifold uh, is flat because we know that if we sit on a manifold and look around, uh, we only, uh, we, we approximate it by its tangent hyperplane in D dimension. I stress that 
the, the tangent hyperplane is in D dimension. And in fact, this has some consequences because but yeah, you just, uh, of you, course. You have, uh, you have, just you have five minutes left. Okay. Okay, I'll I'll go I'll go quick. So so um yeah, the important thing is that uh, so we restrict to very we go very close to the manifold and uh, we look uh, at uh, uh, a regime in which uh, uh, we can use Euclidean Euclidean distances and uh, hyper volumes in a small d dimension. So computing the correct intrinsic dimensionality is crucial. I give credit to this picture to the locally flat Earth Society. Um, so this is the key. These are the key ingredients of of, uh, of k nearest neighbor. Uh, k nearest neighbor. I fix uh, a value of neighbors, which we do optimally, as I said. We count how many neighbors are in a, a in the hypersphere containing k points, and then I uh, compute the volume density as a as a ratio k over the volume. And uh, uh, if I had time, I would explain that there is also a non uh, less intuitive but more formal way to obtain the same result via maximum likelihood uh, procedure, which is this one. So I uh, write the, the likelihood of having a density row observing uh, uh, some volume set shells around the point uh, and uh, and then taking the log of, of this uh, likelihood, I obtain this uh, um, the the k the k nearest neighbor free energy via a likelihood maximization, and the the key ingredient of uh, PAC is uh, to modify this uh, uh, this um, likelihood maximization procedure in order with a variational parameter a in order to allow for linear corrections around the constant density. This also provides a nice, uh, a nice uh, error estimate. And also this uh, maximization procedure has the uh, advantage of giving a, a punctual estimate, which means that it is equivalent uh, of taking the limit for the smoothing parameter going to zero. And this has some consequences, for example, of, uh, on the uh, possibility to reweight uh, the free energy of uh, biased simulation without incurring uh, in the exponential bias average, but doing it with a punctual, simple punctual reweighting. So here is uh, the testing of this method against a realistic free energy landscape. In the correlation plot, so we assessed if uh, uh, we are able to estimate the free energy correctly. So this is uh, the free and the real free energy analytically known plotted against uh, the estimated one. The correlation plots are, are very nice. So this is uh, these are not uh, these are not uh, um, toy models because it's actually a two to seven uh, landscape in two to seven uh, dimension. Uh, with which uh, are embedded in 20 dimension after twisting and stuff like that. So uh, the result is very uh, striking. And uh, uh, yeah, I conclude. So uh, basically only uh, giving as input a metric or a pairwise distance and a reliable ID estimation, we are able uh, to solve uh, um, quite satisfactory all the problems I've mentioned before. Uh, we have a robust uh, and unbiased free energy estimator, uh, which performs quite well in high dimension and, uh, and with rare data. And this is, uh, for example, uh, very much thanks to the adaptivity. It uh, incidentally provides a good error estimates which uh, we could have seen oh, okay, in the in the pool distributions before, and uh, uh, it allows for weighting uh, bias free energy without uh, the exponential average problems. Uh, I thank uh, all the people that worked uh, on these uh, on these methods.
and I thank you for your attention and sorry for taking a bit longer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matero, uh, for this talk. Um, if there's a quick question from the audience, we can take it, or we can wait uh, for after on the gather session. Anyone have a quick question? Okay, maybe we'll leave it for after. Um, so thank you again, Matteo. Uh, we'll move on to our last talk for